40 minutes max, I'll, I'll just uh, lay out the subject matter and then I'll get your questions. So as aspiring to human greatness, well that involves uh, doing the things that Allah Azawajal loves, developing those qualities that Allah does uh, like to see in a, in a person. In the Quran, in, in Surah Ali Imran, in the 31st uh, ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls upon us to follow the Prophet sallallahu uh, as a way of demonstrating our love for Allah Azawajal. Uh, in, uh, in that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Qul, say, in kuntum tuhibun Allah, if you love Allah, meaning if you claim to love Allah, uh, fattabi'uni, then follow me, that is, follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then what will happen? Yuhbibkum Allah, Allah will love you. Wa yaghfir lakum thunubakum, and Allah will forgive uh, you your sins. Wallahu ghafoor rahim, and Allah is forgiving, he is merciful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to love us and forgive our sins if we follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He, in fact, is the greatest person we know of to have walked the, the earth. And no other will walk the earth greater than, than he has. So if, if we want to aspire to human greatness, then what do we do? We follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, he was great in, in so many different areas. As a da'i, as a caller to Allah Azawajal, to pick up on something we said in the Jummah Khutbah today, uh, he was a caller to Allah Azawajal and the caller par excellence. There were prophets before him, and now he was sent as a universal prophet to call all of humankind towards Allah Azawajal. And he did it so well. One of the, the things that we notice in the life of the Prophet وسلم, is the extent to which he exercised patience with people. Giving da'wah means having patience because you're going to talk to people uh, and, and sometimes you feel like you're, you're kicking against the brick wall. It doesn't matter what you say, it's not getting through to the person. But the Prophet ﷺ had patience with people. On one occasion, he was giving da'wah to a man and the man was rejecting everything the Prophet ﷺ said. And one of his companions said, uh, Messenger of God, let me just strike off his head. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, kept you know, like, uh, holding back, holding back his, his companions. Uh, from being so enraged with this man. Eventually, the man embraced Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ said, See, if I let you, uh, where would you have sent him? Uh, but leave me alone with my people. Uh, and he said that he's just like the person who is trying to uh, call a camel. And, uh, you know, apparently the camels are such you have to know the right way to approach them. Otherwise, you drive them further away. So he said, that, you know, leave me because I know what I'm, what I'm doing. Others could not have the patience the Prophet ﷺ had in calling people to Islam, but he had that patience. So the Prophet ﷺ was uh, not only a caller to Islam, but he was also a worshipper of Allah Azawajal. In everything, the Prophet ﷺ strove for excellence. Somebody wrote a book recently about striving for excellence, and that has become like a national bestseller. But, but if you want to know how to strive for excellence, go to the life of the Prophet ﷺ. He was also a worshiper of Allah Azawajal. And in his worship, he had uh, balance, but uh, he also showed the extent to which uh, a servant of Allah Azawajal may worship Allah. Uh, on one occasion, uh, Aisha, the mother of the believers, reported that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, got up from the bed and uh, he was praying and he was uh, uh, reciting such long surahs, standing so long. You know, we, we stand for you know, a page being recited in the Tarawih prayers and we're starting to get a bit restless and we're hoping that the uh, leader would just hurry it up because, um, you know, especially when it's getting late. But the Prophet ﷺ was praying and praying and uh, on occasion, as the Aisha Rajalawan had noted, uh, the feet of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would swell from the fact that he stood up so long in the prayer. And she said to him, Messenger of God, uh, it, it, your, your sins are already forgiven as the Quran itself has said. Uh, stated so why labor so hard he said uh, uh, should I not then be a, a grateful servant a thankful servant so the, the fact that Allah has forgiven his sins doesn't give him a license to now go and do whatever he wants to him uh, he should respond to that by giving thanks to Allah Azawajal. And this is how we should respond as well so the Prophet ﷺ was an excellent da'i was an excellent uh, worshipper of Allah Azawajal. He was uh, also uh, excellent in, in the way in which he dealt with his companions. Uh, the, 
Quran itself says, If you had been hard of heart and, and harsh with them, they would have uh, dissipated from around you. But the Prophet was uh, kind towards his uh, companions and he sought their uh, opinions in matters. O on occasion, he would actually uh, say something, one of his companions would give a different suggestion uh, regarding practical matters, and he would follow the suggestion of his companions, which showed that there are things in which uh, he receives revelation from Allah Azza wa Jal, that obviously is what he and the rest of us have to follow, but then there are things in which he did not receive any specific revelation from Allah, he just uses his judgment and uh, as a human being, uh, somebody else may, may have a, a different insight or more experience on a certain question and he would follow the experience of his companions. That case in point, uh, when uh, the Muslims were besieged uh, by a large allied force, uh, the, uh, one of the companions, Salman the Persian, has uh, said that the way of driving back such a force, based on his experience from where he came from, uh, is that you dig a ditch and that holds them off. And the Prophet ﷺ followed the opinion of Salman and he himself joined in the work of digging that ditch. So the Prophet ﷺ was an expert statesman. The way in which he brought people together and uh, avo he, he avoided conflict between people that too showed his greatness. The Prophet ﷺ was an excellent family person. Uh, he, his daughter Fatima uh, sh sh uh, uh, was treated with respect by the Prophet ﷺ, and she treated him with similar sorts uh, of, of, of respect. It is noted that when the Prophet ﷺ sat in a gathering, if Fatima entered, the Prophet peace be upon him would get up, uh, greet her, kiss her, and then have her sit in the same place where he had been sitting previously. And uh, the reverse is also true. If Fatima was in a gathering, she would do the same, like father, like daughter. See, sometimes we want our children to do good things, but we don't teach them good things. The Prophet ﷺ treated his children with respect, and then that respect is mirrored back. We, we need to treat our children uh, with uh, respect. Sometimes the brothers think, you know, the only way to deal with the kids is just to beat some sense into them. Uh, but in fact, you, you, sense is not something you can beat into kids. You know, sometimes if you beat the kids, what may happen is that the kids may, may learn from that, that the powerful person has the right to beat the weaker one. You know, the kid, you, you're seeing it from your perspective. You're thinking the kid is misbehaving. Let me beat him. He'll learn a lesson and he'll stop misbehaving. He may stop misbehaving because he thinks you have power over him and, and you will crush him if he misbehaves. But then he also imbibes the lesson that the one who has the power can beat the weaker one into whatever the powerful one uh, decides is, is the right thing at the time. Because he doesn't really understand what is right and what is wrong. He's just listening to you because you've got that big stick. Uh, and of course, beating your children, as you know, can lead to other societal and family problems as well. Uh, but it is the teaching of our religion that we apply graciousness. The Prophet ﷺ himself has taught us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to kindness that which he has not given to, to unf or to violence. So we should apply kindness. It's report, reported the Prophet ﷺ never beat uh, a woman or, or, or child or anyone for that matter. Uh, Anas uh, was placed with the Prophet ﷺ when he was uh, only a young boy. His uh, mother uh, wished that Anas would, by serving the Prophet ﷺ, be in his company and learn his ways. And uh, Anas was only 10 at the time. He said that uh, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would send him uh, to do something, and when he went out and saw the other boys playing, he would join in their play and then forget what the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent him to do. And eventually the Prophet himself would come up uh, behind him and address him uh, kindly as Onais, which, which is uh, a, a way of saying little Anas. And uh, then the Prophet, peace be upon him, would remind him of what he was supposed to do. The Prophet was never harsh on him, and didn't rebuke him, and just simply reminded him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that sort of patience. So the Prophet ﷺ uh, was excellent in, in, in everything that he, that he touched. They, the Muslims following the Prophet ﷺ also strove for excellence. And we know that uh, the uh, Muslim civilization uh, rapidly expanded and Muslims uh, developed themselves not only as good worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and excellent uh, 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 aspirers to the life hereafter, but they also uh, conferred benefit to people in a material sense. 
a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, as noted in Sahih Muslim, uh, has the Prophet وسلم, saying uh, that the strong believer, al mu'minul qawi, the strong believer, khayrun, is better and afdal, uh, more, more, uh, more virtuous, min al mu'minul da'if, than the weak believer. Though in, in everyone there is, there is good, in every believer there is good. And then the hadith continues to say that uh, you should uh, be uh, eager to obtain the good of everything. And if it doesn't work out, then you say, Qadar Allahumma sha'a fa'al. But, but don't say, you know, if it had happened this way or if I had uh, done this thing, then something else would have happened. Because just saying if, this just opens up the way for the shaitan. Now, if you think about that hadith carefully, we realize that the Prophet ﷺ was encouraging Muslims to be strong. And, and strong could be in many different ways. You can think of being strong in terms of iman. But this hadith seems more specifically to lean towards the strength of a material sort. The strong believer, strong in everything, is better and more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah, more beloved to Allah Azza wa Jal than the weak believer. And the strength here seems to lean towards the side of being strong in the material things. Because it is only in those things that you will expect that somebody will say, oh, if I had done that, then this. So the use of the if here is problematic in the sense that it excuses a person from doing what is good. That's, that's what a person, you know, people get into this habit. Somebody wrote a book entitled Coulda, Woulda, Shoulda, you know, because that's, what, that's how people say, you know, I could have done that, I would have done that, I should have done that. So don't say coulda, woulda, shoulda. Say I did and actually do it. Do it and then say I did that. And if the results do, does, do not come out the way I expected, then say, Qadar Allahu ma sha'a fa'al. Allah has decreed and whatever he decides happens. You've tried your best and you were not successful. But if you didn't try, then all you're going to say, I wish I had. I could have. I would have. I should have. Don't get into that mood. Get into the mood of saying, I did. And that's because... You did try. You did whatever was within uh, your realm of possibilities. So the Muslim uh, civilization expanded far and wide, and Muslims uh, excelled in so many different fields. Today, uh, we can look back and see the, the greatness of that Muslim civilization. Our English language has traces uh, of uh, words which uh, uh, depict the contribution that Muslims and Arabs, uh, well, the Arabs who were Muslims, made uh, to science and, and civilization over time. If we think of the numbers that we use today, we call them Arabic numerals. And that's for a reason, it's because uh, these numerals uh, were, though introduced uh, or invented in India a long time ago, uh, were eventually taken over by Muslims and uh, then introduced to the rest of the world. So we, we call them Arabic numerals, as uh, compared with, for example, Roman numerals. You know the Roman numerals that are written with, with I's and X's and V's and, uh, and C's and L's and so on. So if you try to write a number, you have this long number composed of a number of I, I's and X's and V's and, uh, and, and C and M and so on and L. And it's hard to multiply and add those. You, you don't see the connection between them as you try to... Uh, perform these uh, arithmetic operations. But with the Arabic numerals, you just have uh, the 10 digits from 0 to 9. And with those 10 digits, you can uh, uh, write an unlimited number of, of numbers. There's no end to it. Because you get to, uh, to uh, up to 9, then you have 10 by the combination of two digits, and then you keep going, then you get 20, then you, you, know, you get to 99, you, you, the next one is 100, now you have to three digits, and so on, and you can keep going ad infinitum. That is the beauty of the Arabic numerals. Then when you're adding and subtracting and so on, you're dealing with uh, numbers, and you can see the, the relationship between uh, the, the given 
and the results which you have achieved. It's a beautiful system. We call them Arabic numerals, and that's because they came through this particular way. Uh, Al-Khwarizmi is one of the Muslims who uh, made uh, significant contributions to uh, this uh, field, and his name came to be uh, related to a field of mathematics which uh, is called uh, uh, algorithm, Al-Khwarizmi algorithm. Uh, the name algebra for a branch of mathematics uh, actually comes from the name of a book in Arabic, Kitab al-Jabr, Kitab al-Jabr al-Muqabala, uh, a, a book that, in which things are, are compared. Uh, th that's what uh, algebra does mostly. You have equations uh, and you know, the, the right side of the equation has to be equal to the left side of the equation and you make uh, adjustments and so on. What's uh, an adjustment to one side has to equal an adjustment to the other side for the equation to, to remain valid. Uh, in, in many different fields, we find in medicine that uh, Ar-Razi was one of the first persons to, uh, in fact the first, uh, to have uh, properly diagnosed uh, and, and described uh, uh, smallpox. Uh, the book uh, Al-Kanun fi tib written by uh, Ibn Sina, was used in the Middle Ages from about the 17th century, uh, 17th and 18th centuries, uh, throughout uh, Europe uh, in, in those days. That became the standard textbook for, for studying medicine. Uh, Muslims, in fact, studied the medicine of, of Greek and other scholars that were available prior to that. They made their own contributions and eventually developed this to, uh, to become the standard in their day. People had to come from other countries into Muslim Spain and learn Arabic in order to study things like medicine which is the reverse of what is happening today, whereas people now from Arab countries have to go to other countries, learn perhaps English or some other language, and study these uh, modern sciences. Uh, in uh, astronomy, uh, we have uh, some names that uh, survive in the English language depicting the contributions. Uh, for example, Azimuth, and Zenith, and Nadir. All of these are, uh, in fact, uh, based on Arabic uh, words. Uh, Betelgeuse is actually Bait al Jauza, uh, and, and that came to be known as uh, that, that comes to be uh, you know, the name of a star. Uh, nowadays, Muslims had set up uh, observatories in many different parts of the, of the world, uh, and uh, based on their observations, uh, they then documented their, uh, their, their uh, conception uh, of the universe. We speak nowadays of the Copernican Revolution, which uh, changed the way in which people thought about uh, the universe. But uh, prior to Copernicus himself, at, at Tusi had already uh, depicted uh, a, a similar sort of conception uh, of, of the universe. Prior to that, people were thinking that uh, uh, the Earth is the center of the, of the universe. And uh, now, at Tusi showed that the Earth itself uh, is in an orbit and revolving around the sun. Uh, the fact that the Earth is spherical was already known to Muslim scientists long before this became so commonplace in, in the West. The Quran itself speaks of uh, the uh, Earth as though it is a ball, because in, in Surah, the 39th chapter of the Quran, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yukawiru layla anan nahar, Allah coils the day upon the night and coils the night upon the day. The verb there for coiling is yukawir, and yukawir is related to the word for ball, which, mean, which is kura in, in Arabic. So you have the idea of the, the earth as a kura, as a ball, and the day and the night being coiled around it, just like a person is coiling a turban around his head. Uh, so, so Muslims had the idea very early on uh, that the, the earth is in fact uh, spherical. The idea that things are moving about in, in, in spheres and in orbits uh, uh, are shown in the Quran because the Quran says Each uh, of these objects are moving, each is moving in its particular uh, orbit. Moreover, the Quran says yasbahun, they swim. Uh, which is interesting the way this is put, because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the clouds, uh, the idea there is that the clouds are being driven, uh, because there's some force being exerted on the cloud, driving it, the wind is blowing the clouds. But when uh, Allah speaks about the, the heavenly bodies, 
they, they swim, the Quran says. Yes, Bahun, they swim. And if we think of a swimmer, the swimmer is moving gracefully uh, with the own, the, uh, the generated momentum from within. Uh, and these uh, heavenly bodies are doing a similar thing. Uh, so we can go on and on, but the idea here is that uh, Muslims developed various uh, f areas of civilization and that will eventually get translated into the uh, other languages and into other civilizations. Things which come to us nowadays as very commonplace uh, were known to Muslims uh, a long time ago. Nowadays we're very careful about uh, health and, and uh, hygiene and well-being. Well, the Prophet ﷺ taught his followers to use the miswak. And uh, some of the brothers think that miswak only refers to a, spe a specific type of twig that you get from a tree. Well, that's what it was at a certain time because that's the only thing that people had as, as miswak. Uh, but you can manufacture one that's more specific that uh, does the job in a better way. You can manufacture the, the, the kinds of pastes and, and gels. Uh, that will clean in a better way and, and uh, fight cavity and so on. All of these are developments. Uh, this is why in the English translation of uh, As Sayyid Sabik's uh, book, we find uh, that it, oral hygiene is spoken of as the sunnah. And that indeed is what the sunnah is. The Prophet ﷺ was teaching his followers oral hygiene. And the way of achieving oral hygiene at that time was to use the miswak, a particular twig which is best known for the juices that will help to, uh, in this process of achieving oral hygiene. So for, for a Muslim today to follow that sunnah, uh, what we need to do is to do all of these things, all of the things that will contribute to oral hygiene, including visiting your dentist on a regular basis and using all of the available uh, mechanisms uh, to achieve that particular end. The Prophet ﷺ taught uh, cleanliness in so many different ways. Cleanliness in, way, in the way we use the bathroom, for example. A washing in, in wudu, uh, this now comes to us so naturally that we don't realize how important it is. But if there is uh, a, an outbreak of a virus of some kind, that's when people realize how important it is to wash because you will see the government uh, uh, services will start putting up signs uh, encouraging people, wash your hands and, and wash your hands regularly. That's what we're doing. We're washing our hands regularly, and by washing our hands and our faces and our limbs of our uh, other limbs of our bodies, we are in fact uh, containing uh, the the spread of viruses. But of course, we're doing this for a religious reason. We are trying to achieve purity, not of a physical kind, but of a spiritual kind. Uh, th th that's why we're washing the hands and, and so on. We're not washing necessarily those physical parts of the body which uh, have been contaminated. Yes, those will be washed in a particular way, but the wudu itself is not for washing those parts. The wudu washes parts that do not seem to have any connection uh, with, with the origins of, of the hadith or, or some, some event that, that makes us now realize now we have to make wudu. Why are we making wudu in this particular way? We are achieving spiritual cleanliness. It's cleansing the mind. And at the same time, while cleansing the mind, we are achieving that physical purity at this, uh, simultaneously. So you see the practical nature of the religion of Allah Azawajal. While we are being called to spirituality, the world is not being neglected. And while we are being called by the Quran uh, to achieve those, those qualities which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and which I described in my la talk here on this subject last year, now we, we are also being encouraged to achieve excellence in the physical realm. And that too is beloved by Allah Azza wa Jal. So finally, as I, as I close this talk, uh, we should ask ourselves, uh, why is it that Muslims are not achieving this, excellent, this excellence? Why are we no longer achieving what our forefathers achieved? And how can we reclaim that now? Well, the answer to such a complex question may itself be, be complex. The reasons may be several. One of the reasons, obviously, is that uh, over time there has been a separation uh, between the, the spiritual and the mundane. For our ancestors, this, th these two were interconnected. The Muslim scholar could also have been a scientist. 
he did not think of in his mind that one has to only go one way. Either you're a scientist or you are a, a Muslim spiritual leader. Naturally, over time, a lot of things got uh, segregated in, in this way because uh, the fields became more intense. People had to specialize. But let's not, in specializing in this way, lose sight of the interconnectivity between these various areas. And let us work in groups. Let the scientist and the alim, actually an alim is, is, means scientist too, but, but, but uh, nowadays when we say alim, we mean the spiritual uh, scholar. But let, let the spiritual scholar and the, the scholar of the physical science, let the two alims, sit together and learn from each other and inform each other. So we have to have this connectivity again between the sciences. One of the obvious reason is that Muslims, in, in pursuing the dunya, forgot the akhirah. And so by pursuing the dunya in this way, we lost that blessing of Allah azawajal. We need to bring the two back together. Pursuing the dunya, but not forgetting the akhira. Pursuing the akhira, but at the same time paying attention to the demands of the dunya. We need to bridge that connection one more time. Ikhwani fillah, my brothers and sisters in Islam, it is important that as we stand now in the third millennium, that we reintroduce to the world that Islam which our Prophet وسلم, left behind. That is an Islam which strove for excellence. That is an Islam which was blessed with the Prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who was excellent in his ibadah. He was an excellent caller to Allah. Azawajal. He was an excellent governor, a statesman. He was an excellent family man. He was good to children. We are followers of that Prophet Muhammad He is the one who told us that the strong believer is more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. We have to be strong in all of the various avenues. That is also a way of doing da'wah. People are now looking to the civilizations of the world and they're asking where does the greatness lie? And they're not seeing it in the Muslim civilization. They're not seeing it in our intensity of worship. They're not seeing it in the characteristics of Muslims. And they're not seeing it anymore in the advances in science and technology. We have forgotten our heritage. And in this conference, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the guidance, reorients our minds, so that we can again reclaim the glory that rightly belongs to the message that he has revealed and to the followers of that message. Wa dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I'd be glad to take your questions. Shukran. You, you can tell us about how the questions will be handled if you have an idea of how, how, how you'd like to do that. If anyone has any questions, I mean, put, put up your hand now. So the question is, why, why are we not succeeding in the way that our forefathers um, did? Why have we lost that uh, glory? And uh, there, there are several reasons. I didn't uh, offer all of them, uh, but uh, I, I did say that uh, one of the reasons is that we uh, separated the two fields of learning, uh, learning about uh, religious subjects, uh, as we may come to classify them, and learning about uh, physical uh, sciences. We, we came to see these two as, as two separate spheres. And, and that has been a problem that affected us in many different ways. But one of the ways is that it, it, it now meant that uh, the, the advances in science and technology could no longer be credited to Islam. That, that, that's one of the issues. Uh, but it also meant that uh, the, the, the way in which the two uh, sciences were integrated 
and gave a dynamism to the Muslim community to pursue these uh, physical sciences as part of our religious heritage and part of our religious obligation that was lost on the Muslims eventually. So science became something that you may do if you want to, but not something that, that Muslims are obligated to pursue. Whereas, in fact, the Quran uh, calls on us to reason, to think, to use our intellect. And I'm sure that uh, uh, they, they, uh, our, our Sheikh uh, will, will be addressing it in, uh, in Shuhab Hassan will be speaking about the use of reason uh, in the next talk, which uh, I would encourage you to come out to and I myself will be here. So we'll hear more about that. But the Quran tells us, "Kul siru fil ardi fanduru kaifa bada Allahu al-khalq." Travel in the world and and see how God has initiated creation. So there are other people who are trying to travel in the world and do archaeology and study history and, and, and look at geology and try to understand how the world uh, originated in a material and physical sense. But but we we drop that. We're not doing that anymore because we came to think that, okay, how the world was created, this is a religious topic. God created the world, that's the end of the matter. Uh, so that, that now that is religious, and then we just give a blanket answer, uh, the question is dropped. So that, that's one of the issues that we separated uh, the, the two. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention previously, and now in response to the question, I, I feel it's important to add, is that... Uh, uh, things go in ebbs and, and flows. Uh, the, the power is not ours to keep for all, all time unless we continue uh, to do the things which will retain that glory which Allah has given us. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah, la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is within themselves. And of course, we think of it now, we think of this verse as uh, implying how we should try to reclaim that glory because we have to make some changes now. Uh, but initially, we lost it because we had changed. And this is what many of the Mufassirun uh, say uh, about this verse, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Muslims the glory so long as they deserved it, but when the Muslims themselves changed, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it away. So that's one of the ways that we had changed and that we made that separation uh, between uh, the, the two uh, sciences. The question is about the availability nowadays of uh, Islamic schools as an alternative to the public uh, schools, right? Is that what you call them? Did you call them secondary schools? Um, whether secondary or, or primary, elementary or, or advanced, uh, they, 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 there is a fear in, in, uh, among Muslims that if we send our kids to the public uh, environment, then they will lose that opportunity to develop uh, as they should as Muslims. And uh, in fact, they may adopt ideas and, and characteristics, attitudes which are contrary to the spirit of Islam. Uh, uh, many, many uh, of you obviously uh, have sent kids uh, to uh, public schools and, and you didn't see that bad result. So you might be thinking, well, what's all the fuss about? But then on the other hand, there are many who have uh, seen such bad results. Uh, in, in their kids, and they, they understand that it is beneficial to have a private, separate uh, school in which our kids can develop and grow and uh, pick up Islamic attitudes and learn the Islamic adab and character and so on. And, and I, I believe that this is necessary. Uh, in the formative years, uh, the children are developing, they're growing, they're picking up attitudes in a very subtle manner. Uh, they look at the behavior of their teachers and that registers with them. Uh, children uh, love and, and respect their teachers and they try to adopt their characteristics and their attitudes and, and, and the way in which they address uh, issues and so on. So we, we need these separate schools. 
uh, and, and that requires sacrifice on the part of parents uh, and of the community as a whole. But it is something that is necessary and that we have to do. Uh, but uh, how that relates to our subject here is, uh, you know, on the question of the separation of the two, and this seems now to be contrary, am I saying that the two need to be separate? No. Uh, the, the Islamic school itself should integrate the two areas of knowledge. One, the lear learning about uh, things which are uh, so clearly uh, Islamic, learning about the Quran, the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Islamic adab and spirituality and ibadat and, and so on. But at the same time, we should never fall behind on the academic subjects. Our Muslim students should be tops in science and mathematics and geography and history and, and so on. Uh, and in that sense then, we should see that there are some Islamic schools where the idea is only to teach the kids to memorize the Quran or to become what they're, they're calling ulama of the religion. Uh, such schools have made a separation. They have felt that it is only important for the child to be a hafiz, for example, of the Quran. Now in the Jummah Khutbah, I spoke about how easy it is to, to memorize the, the Quran. But uh, that does not mean uh, that uh, to memorize the Quran, you must now uh, go to a school full time and, and neglect everything else. Uh, sometimes a child is put in such a school to memorize the Quran and uh, the whole program may be three years. And during those three years, the child may actually be deprived uh, of the academic studies. And after the three years, then they go back into the public school system and they may be put in a grade uh, 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 belonging to children of a, of, a, of a lower age. So all of this could have uh, detrimental effects on, on the psychology of the developing Muslim child here uh, because the child may feel that he's backward in something and eventually, as you know, we, we live in a dunya and we're surrounded by the dunya and shaitan is always calling on us and giving us ideas. In the end, as you know, money talks and it affects all of us. The most uh, spiritual of us in the end, we have to pay our bills, so everybody needs to have a job, he needs to have a means of earning and a decent one. So when one looks around and sees what one, one's peers are doing and how one, his peers are excelling in the world and they're getting good jobs and so on, the, the, the Muslim child could feel, yeah, you know, I've, I've wasted some of my time here. He hasn't wasted his time, but he may feel that way. Because whatever we gain in terms of memorizing the Quran and learning of the religion and so on, this is gain and we should never think that something else is better. But what's going to happen to the child eventually is that many of them are going to think that something else is better. And we as parents should not create that situation in which our kids are going to be thinking like this. We know how we think, but don't expect the kid to think the same way. And don't put them in that difficult situation. So what we need to do then is to create that sort of school that integrates the two types of knowledge, have them flow hand in hand. The child may not memorize the entire Quran, but that's okay. Because it's not an obligation for every person to memorize the entire Quran. We should have in our community people who have acquired all of the skills that are needed as a community. But few people with that skill and few people with the other skill. And that in, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was necessary for people to memorize the Quran. For many generations later, until the Quran was written in, in the materials that could be easily copied and circulated, people had to memorize the Quran because that was the only way of, of preserving the Quran. Writing materials were scarce and they were also bulky. So hardly did anyone have a complete copy of the Quran in writing. Because it, it would take many pages, it was a bulky uh, set of, uh, of materials that could collect the entire Quran. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ died, the Quran was written on a wide variety of materials and scattered uh, in the possession of many different persons. So Zaid bin Thabit uh, radiallahu an, had to go around from one person to another, see what they have, and then write them onto sheets. And then those sheets were left with Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and then eventually with Omar radiallahu an, and then uh, Uthman. Uh, sorry, with Hafsa, the daughter of o o Omar, an, and then Uthman an, borrowed those sheets, and then he had them transcribed. And then only about four or seven copies were made, and each was sent to a major center of Islamic learning. 
So it's not like every Muslim had a copy of the Quran in writing. So if people wanted to, the Quran to be preserved, and every Muslim wanted that, they had to preserve it in their memories. So one had to sit and painstakingly go over it, make sure that one memorized the, the entire book. And nowadays, of course, we don't need for everyone to memorize the book because the Quran is so well preserved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to preserve it in, in writing, in CD, and, and, and so, in so many different uh, uh, ways. We may need some people to read, lead the Tarabi prayer, so we need a few hafaz. And we need people to read the Quran in public gatherings. And we need some people symbolically to, to remind us of the fact that the Quran is a book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved in the hearts and memories of, of people, men and women. So that said, we don't need everybody to be a hafiz. We need people to excel in, excel in various fields. So the, the, the Islamic school should integrate the various areas of, of knowledge in a way that is practical and that produces the, the students who will be functional in our modern world, who will be excellent in various ways, so that if one leaves an Islamic school and goes to the other school, the other student should be amazed at this Muslim kid. Who is this super kid who came in here and he knows so many things and we're just struggling to learn these things? So a Muslim kid should never appear to be backward or delinquent or you know, failing in, in, in the subjects that uh, are commonly studied uh, in this country. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the guidance and help us to excel in everything. I, I don't know how much time we, we have left, but uh, um, you be the guide of this. Uh, would, uh, we'd like to just include um, two questions from the sisters. Um, <coughs> Sure, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just try quickly. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll try them all just to, uh, I mean, I'll give short answers, but um, since somebody has bothered to write the questions, you know, let's, let's uh, do some justice and try to answer them. Uh, you guys going to sacrifice a few minutes if you break for that? Yeah? Shukran Jazeelan. Okay, question. Uh, were these scientists who made these important discoveries simple, simply Muslims, or were Muslim scientists inspired to look deeper into their research fields because of the Quran? I believe it's both. Uh, they, they, they lived in a time when the science and was develop, developing within their society, and so naturally they made those developments. Uh, but they, their society itself was inspired by and directed by the Quranic revelation. Uh, the first uh, message that came to the Prophet ﷺ, according to Sirah of Ibn Ishaq, is uh, the, the verse from the Quran that says, Iqra, read. And, and then another uh, verse subsequent to that uh, came and praised the pen. Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturoon. Noon and the pen by the pen and what it writes, it inscribes. So Allah is mentioning reading, and soon after that is mentioning writing. So these are important uh, uh, areas uh, of learning, reading and writing, and next will come the, the arithmetic, right? Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum. What is the best way to develop patience? As I find this is a hard quality to develop, and I tried, uh, and, and this ends up being, I end up being impatient again. Well, one of the things uh, that has helped me to, to be patient is uh, to, to always assume that there is a reason behind things. Because I find that one of the reasons for being impatient is when we think that things are stupid, things you know, are, uh, are happening without reason. So somebody did something, we say, uh, he, that person is stupid, you know, he, he did this without reason. But if you try to think that maybe the person has a reason for doing that, no matter if it is a reason that makes no sense, but if you try now to understand what that reason is, then you may discover it to be a reason that is no good, but now you might understand how people think. So this person does this thing for that reason, I thought it was a good reason, and I pursued the thinking on that basis. In the end, I find out it's not a very good reason, but that itself is interesting because it shows that people do things for reasons which are no good. And, and now you want to analyze the person. So in this analytical frame of mind, uh, you, you're, you're, you have no, re no time to be impatient or, or because you, your, your mind is busy thinking and, and trying to solve a problem here and trying to discover more. This has helped me especially in debates because you know to, um, many Muslims sometimes send me emails and say, Brother Shabir, we're, you know, I don't know how we can have the patience because people are watching these debates and, and they're hearing the other person speak, and they're thinking, you know, what nonsense. And how does uh, Brother Shabir sit there and listen to all of this? Well, I, I analyze, you know. 
This is how people think. This is how they believe. This is what they've been trained to believe. This is how people have been brainwashed. And that's interesting in itself. How, how do we, this is a problem for us. How do we unbrainwash the person and so on? So I, I'm there thinking. And while I'm thinking, I have no chance to be upset or to be mad or to be impatient. In fact, if I get mad or impatient or upset, then what will happen? My thinking will stop. You see, that's the opposite of it. If my thinking stops, then when I come to speak and I have to reply to what the guy said, I'll have no reply. See? So I need to think. And that's the same for all of us. Uh, realize how important it is to think and, uh, and, and start thinking. Question. Uh, you said that we should not hit children to discipline them. However, when children do not pray uh, in namaz, we should hit them. How, so how do we discipline children? Putting kids in the uh, naughty... In the, does it say naughty corner? Put his kids in the naughty corner. Uh, does not work. Well, there is a hadith which, which says something similar to what the, the sister has written here about disciplining children for the fact that they're not praying. At the same time, uh, when, when we apply, uh, whether, whether it's a verse of the Quran or a hadith, we should see our context and the situation, like what will happen as a result of this. If you're doing something in a situation and somebody asks you, why did you do that? And you say, okay, because Allah told me to do this. Now, think about the impact on that person. If this some, what you're doing looks wholesome and good, the other person is going to say, ah, that's good. You, you have a good God that tells you these things. That's, that's interesting. Uh, tell me more about it. All right. But let's say you're doing something which in that situation will look to people ugly and, and bad and and quite objectionable. Now you do it, they ask you, why did you do it? You say, because God told me to do it. So they say, man, what kind of God do you have? So, you know, so now, what you're doing here is you're giving a bad impression about Allah Azza wa Jal, right? Now, if Allah really said that, and He told you to do that thing in this particular situation, and you're just doing it, then it's not your fault, true? Because He told you, you did it, whatever people want to think, that's up to them, that's their business, and they can take it up with Allah when they see Him. But the question is, did Allah tell you to do that thing in that situation? So think now. So if he didn't tell you to do that thing in that situation, and you're doing it, it's possible that you're misrepresenting Allah. Don't misrepresent Allah. Now if something is said in the Quran, that is different than if something is said in the Hadith. If something is said in the Quran, no Muslim has any doubt that it's from Allah Azza wa Jal. True? The Quran is so well preserved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna luhu la We have revealed their dhikr and we are preserving it. If something is said in a hadith, then that more contextual issues come into play. Because when we're dealing with the Quran, this is something that is universal. It's uh, mentioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, this is of a different category than when the Prophet sallallahu is saying something to his companions. Because now it's contextual. There is a situation there at hand. There's an interaction between two persons. The Prophet, his companions, a situation on the ground. As opposed to a kind of universal judgment on things coming from uh, on high. Moreover, if a hadith is found in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, this uh, has more authenticity than it if, it if it is found in another source. So you need to think carefully, not just any hadith, any statement attributed to the Prophet wasallam, and then you just credit it to him for any situation. So know what the situation is, know what the context is. So in the ancient world, people generally discipline their children. In the Bible, it is mentioned that you should not spare the rod uh, because the kindness to your children means actually to beat them, beat, you know, uh, beat them in order to mold them and so on. So nowadays people are, are objecting to the Bible on this basis. So before giving them a reason to object to your Prophet Wasallam and to his statements, think carefully, first of all, whether this really is his statement. And secondly, did he mean it for your present situation or uh, did it fit in a certain historical context and it was fine then. But if you try to do that in a different situation, it will give the wrong impression about your religion, about your Prophet, about your God. So don't give the wrong impression. Nowadays, it is quite widely uh, acknowledged that if you beat children, then uh, really what you're doing is that you're, you're giving them the impression that uh, the, the powerful can beat the less powerful. 
No, this is a question for psycholo psychological study. If that, if that conclusion from psychology is not true, not correct, then let some Muslim students come up, let them do some PhD theses on, 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 a, on this question, and let them show a different result. If they show us a different result, then we have some backing. But if you're not able to show a different result, then what, what are you doing here with this? We have many different ways. The Prophet ﷺ is the same Prophet who told us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in kindness, in rifq, that which he has not put in, in violence, in unf. And he himself did not beat anyone. So that is his example. Uh, so that is what Muslims should better be, be copying. Then how do you discipline the children? Uh, well, in order to make, get them to pray namaz, beating them to me is of, is of no purpose. But how are you going to beat them to make them pray namaz? It, it, are, are they going to love praying namaz because you, you beat them? Uh, no, they're going to hate doing that and they're going to do it for a while because you beat them. Very seldom would it be a result that you, know, you beat them and they started to pray and now they so love the prayer that they, they are praying on their own. Mostly what we find happening is that the children are obeying the parents on this basis. They're following Islam till they're about 16. Then the law of the land kicks in and says that the child can leave home and you can't reclaim them. Then they do whatever they want. So they're just living out the time until they can do whatever they want. So you face them, you force them to do something. You force the women, to the girls to wear hijab. And so they wear it till they're gone out of sight. When they arrive at school, they don't have it anymore. When they're back in sight, they're approaching home. They have it all over again. So... We need a different approach. What we need to do is persuade them. And to persuade them, we have to start very young. We have to sit with them and, and give time. Uh, explain to them why we feel that this is important. And help them to think that the thing is important. Ask them questions, get their feedback, see what they're thinking. And now you know what you have to do in order to persuade them. Try persuasion, and that requires time. You know, to use the whip, that's very quick but it doesn't give the long-term results. Using persuasion, that involves a lot more time. It involves sitting down with them. Uh, sometimes you have to live on less because you can't have two jobs if you want to do that. And uh, it has long-term effects. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us quickly. Uh, you mentioned that the Prophet uh, was kind and not harsh in giving dawah to the companions. Uh, Brother Shabir, my husband is a good man, but uh, I hope I'm not revealing too much here by reading out this answer. Uh, but with a very bad temper, uh, so a good man with a bad temper, that's you. Uh, and harsh, uh, harsh with his family, a third description. I try to talk to him and give him uh, examples of the Prophet's uh, way, but he always has excuses. Uh, that's all of us. Uh, perhaps uh, he may listen to you. After all, I am uh, only uh, the wife, so we know he's here. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Akhi, uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has actually uh, encouraged us in his book to be kind towards our family, to be kind to the wife in particular. And uh, in, in that context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, do not take his uh, re revelation as a jest. Don't take the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as, uh, as a joke. Uh, so we should be kind to the family. And of course the Prophet ﷺ listened to his wives, he sought their opinions. Uh, when the, uh, at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was signed, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ didn't know what to do. They had the sacrificial animals with them, they're ready to go to the Kaaba. Now they're being prevented from going and the Prophet ﷺ agreed to this. He made an agreement with, uh, the, with the Kuffar that, that okay, they're not going to go ahead with the, with the Umrah. So the companions are, are puzzled. Umar came to the Prophet, he said, aren't you the messenger of Allah? He said, yes. He said, isn't the Islam the truth? He said, yes. He said, didn't you say that we're going? He said, yes, I said we're going, but does it have to be this year? They're still puzzled because obviously they feel that there's a kind of a compromise here. And we have our animals. These animals have to be sacrificed. We have to take them to the right place to sacrifice. We're stuck outside here. And the Prophet has made this agreement. What are we to do? They don't know what to do. Uh, the the uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen, uh, Umm Salma, uh, said to the Prophet Sallallahu you just uh, sacrifice your animal. And that was so simple, but it didn't occur to the Prophet, peace be upon him, until she said it. So he sacrificed his own, and then the others saw that, and they started sacrificing their animals too. The matter was dropped. Okay? So the Prophet Sallallahu listened to the advice of his wife. Uh, brother, listen to the advice of your wife, uh, and, uh, and take the best of what... Uh, is available to you.
A question. In the previous talk about identity, the lecturer uh, mentioned that a person uh, can only reach, uh, preach Islam if he has studied Islam. He also mentioned that you reach a scholarly uh, level and attain knowledge, and only then you can give da'wah. But what about the hadith that says, preach Islam if uh, you know only one ayah? Uh, from what I heard the previous uh, speaker was saying, uh, it's not either or, uh, this or that. He was, he was emphasizing the need to have knowledge to preach. And uh, I was saying the same thing in my khutbah today, uh, if, you, if you recall. So it doesn't prevent others from speaking what they know. Uh, if you know something, yes, you can convey to the other person, as the hadith says, uh, convey from me even if it is an ayah. Uh, so you're not prevented from, from preaching, and you're, in fact, you're encouraged to preach what you know. And you know tawheed, uh, spread it to the other people. Uh, but we, as I said in the khutbah today, we need professional people to function at the professional level. And uh, the layperson shouldn't imagine that he or she is a professional. And we, we need to make that distinction. Do what you can at your level, but don't try to put yourself in a position where you'll be asked to answer a question and you don't know the answer. Be like Imam Malik. Even he doesn't know the answer to certain questions, as Sheikh Saad was saying earlier. Or even if he knows, he doesn't feel it is appropriate to answer at that time, and so on. Question. Uh, sometimes hadith seem to contradict each other. How can we best follow the sunnah with our limited knowledge of religion? Well, this is where we have to consult the scholarship. And uh, commentaries have been written on the hadith books. Uh, unfortunately, most of this is still available in, in the Arabic language. Uh, but uh, soon enough, they'll be translated. And so this is a project that people need to work on to translate the great commentaries on, on the hadith works and, and also to write new commentaries. Uh, to help us to understand and, and, and reconcile the hadiths which seem sometimes to contradict each other. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq, the strength, uh, the grace, and, and uh, the poise to always uh, worship him in every situation, to follow our religion, even when it seems difficult, uh, and even when it does not seem to make sense to others. We ask you, Ya Rabbul Alameen, to help us to achieve the excellence that our forefathers achieved, and help us to demonstrate your religion as one that makes sense. Uh, that uh, we uh, take seriously in our own lives and that we help others to understand Ya Rabbul Alameen. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.